Well, thank you very much, Scott, and thank you to everybody uh, for coming here to listen to me today to talk about the Red River Expedition. Um, I've subtitled it British Regulars and Canadian Volunteers Across the Canadian Shield, and also with a question mark, is it the dispatch of a garrison or a punitive expedition? And we'll get into that a little bit as I go through the presentation. Now, I am going to be double fisting uh, with uh, my notes, so with two different mouse, mouses, mice here, uh, as I do this, but we'll, uh, well, hopefully it works. So the, the genesis of the project was that I was approached by a publisher in the UK asking if I was interested in writing a book on a Victorian military campaign. And ultimately, we settled on the Red River Expedition. I understood why the editor wanted it. It was Garnet Wolseley's first independent command. And it was also the last military expedition by the British Army in North America. But it was, I was a bit surprised at how keen they were because up at that point, my view was that not a great deal happened. Uh, uh, there, wasn't, there wasn't much in the way of fighting. There was no, well, there wasn't any fighting. There wasn't even a skirmish. Uh, but I was quickly drawn in. The complexities of planning, logistics, the background events, and along with the many controversies of the expedition itself just made this a compelling topic for me to research and write on. You know, I, I quickly concluded military campaigns are not just about battles, and there are still stories to be told even when there's no fighting. A quick note on place names that I'm going to talk about today. Um, Red River Settlement and Upper Fort Gary, I tend, I'm going to tend to uh, use them both interchangeably. In 1870, the Red River Settlement was the largest settlement, the largest community within the lands administered by the Hudson's Bay Company. And as you'll see in a second, that's what you've got to get, wrap your head around initially, is that the land we're talking about at the start of the story is not part of Canada. Uh, Upper Fort Gary was the headquarters of the Hudson's Bay Company, located in the heart of the settlement at the Forks, the junction of the Red and Assiniboine Rivers. And of course, if there's an Upper Fort Gary, there's not surprisingly a lower Fort Gary. It's also, it was and still is, uh, downriver from where the upper fort was located, uh, still within the confines of the Red River settlement. So the background. Um, the story of how the Red, Red River settlement came to be in the first place is a fascinating one. Uh, unfortunately, there is not time in a 45-minute presentation to get into that in any great detail. I'll just throw out a few events, and then again, as Scott has said, if you're interested, there, you can certainly do your own research. But the origins uh, go back to the time of the Hudson's Bay Company and Northwest Company rivalry. Uh, then you have thrown into the mix the arrival of the Selkirk settlers, the development of the Métis national identity, and then just over the next 50 plus years, the events that go on at the, uh, at the settlement are interesting in their own right. They're all fascinating, but what is pertinent to the story today is that by 1870, there was a population of about 12,000 people living at the Red River Settlement. It was the largest, as I say, settlement in the lands administered by the Hudson's Bay Company. And by 1870, of that 12,000, 48.1% were French-speaking people of, of mixed ethnicity, the Métis. 34.1% were English speakers of, of mixed ethnicity, and they were known at the time as the country-born. 13.1% were white, mostly descendants of the Selkirk settlers, who by then were known as the Kildonan Scots but also some Canadian settlers had moved to the area by then. And there's also a population of Canadian and American businessmen who, uh, who, uh, who run the commerce of the area. And then 4.7% were Aboriginal. There's very little modern writing on the subject of the Red River Expedition. The same cannot be said of the events that triggered its dispatch. Uh, it's, it's a pivotal event in the history of the Canadian West. And, and as such, it's been extensively researched, written about, and interpreted and reinterpreted. Uh, if mentioned at all in the various studies that are done, 
the Red River Expedition itself gets maybe a paragraph or half a page. My study reversed this emphasis, and, and I'll, I'll note today I'll provide a quick overview of the events at the Red River Settlement over the winter of 1869-1870, but the focus of, that I have is on the expeditionary force. And you'll see there, uh, just in the slide, just to emphasize the change in interpretation, rebellion, uprising, troubles, opposition, resistance. It's been called all of those over various times as the, as the subject matter has been reinterpreted. So in a nutshell, what was it all about? Well, Canada was in the process of acquiring the vast lands of what would become the Canadian West from the Hudson's Bay Company. So if you look at those two maps up there, you'll see on the left, there's Canada as it was from 1867 until the takeover of the, of the lands. And then you compare it, because you can see Canada in the second map on the right, uh, in kind of turquoisey blue, it looks like from this angle. And all of that territory is what is acquired. All the territory in pink is what is acquired in uh, 18, uh, 1870, including uh, the little province of Manitoba at the bottom, which we'll talk about a little bit. I think uh, the borders of British Columbia at that time are not quite as clear cut as they're shown in this map, but uh, that's something for a different topic. And you may notice as well that the Arctic islands are not included. They don't actually come to Canada until the 1880s. Um, so the problem, it's a sizable piece of real estate, as you can see, but the problem is that the Canadian government has done nothing to prepare the people at the Red, Red River Settlement for the forthcoming takeover. Now, in defense of Canada's Prime Minister, John A. Macdonald, he had rather a lot on his plate at the time. Uh, and in addition to that, the Hudson's Bay Company leadership, they kept their people largely in the dark as well. So, so there was a fair degree of bitterness directed at the HBC as well from its employees. But a few things happen that kind of stir things up. Uh, there's, there's an arrival in 1868 and then again in 1869 of Canadian road, work, road builders and, uh, and surveyors. And uh, they, that didn't really help matters because initially they didn't show a great deal of respect for the Métis property rights. But added to this, and this is something that usually gets overlooked, there'd been drought conditions in the area for several years, there had been grasshopper infestations, and there had also been a failure of the local river and lake fishery. So times were hard at the Red River Settlement, and there was a very real possibility of hunger. Um, and it was around this time, into this mix, that Louis Rial returned to the settlement, and we'll hear a little bit more about him. Um, it's fair to say that the Métis were seeking to protect their culture and guarantee the rights, specifically those of land ownership. Rial didn't think that Ottawa was listening, and so he decided to make the case directly to the Canadian government. It's also fair to say that the English-speaking groups didn't necessarily have the same concerns, and so they didn't share the same issues as the Métis. But I, but I will add that not all English speakers were opposed to Rial, but at the same time, not all French speakers supported him either. So let's talk a little bit about the political background. And this is going to be, I'm not really going to do justice to these events. They're quite dramatic and tense over the winter of 1869, 1870. As I say, my focus is on the expedition. So I'm going to skim over this stuff very high level. Ultimately, a political agreement was hammered out by the various groups at the Red River Settlement. Three representatives from, the, from Red River then traveled to Ottawa and an agreement was reached with the Canadian government. This included the establishment of Manitoba, the province of Manitoba. The Manitoba Act followed and was granted royal assent on May 12, 1870. It was to come into effect on July 15. When the terms of the agreement reached the Red River Settlement, Riel expressed satisfaction and the, uh, the agreement was ratified by the Red River Assembly. It sounds done and dusted. However, at the beginning of March 1870, after the agreement had been reached at the settlement, but before the delegates had set out for Canada, something occurred 
that would have a profound impact on the events that followed. Thomas Scott, pictured in the slide at the top, and unfortunately for him in the bottom as well, Thomas Scott uh, was being held prisoner at Upper Fort Garry, which had been seized by the Métis. He was executed after a summary trial. He was by all accounts a very difficult man, although whether this justified him being killed is another matter entirely. But word of Scott's death caused outrage in Ontario with widespread calls for the dispatch of a military force to avenge his death. John A. Macdonald, he had to act or he was going to risk losing political support in Ontario. But at some point too, given the fact that Canada is aspiring to take control of this vast new piece of real estate, they were going to send a military force to the West for the maintenance of law and order and the defense of their new territories. Once he became aware of the unrest, John A. Macdonald, ever the deal maker, decided to try and make a, uh, make a deal with Riel, and as we've seen, ultimately a deal was done. But at the same time, he spoke quite early on the potential of sending a military force to the West. And many of his early statements on the subject were belligerent. But he, what he seemed to be thinking at that point was much more, going back to that question, is, is it a punitive expedition or, or a military garrison to maintain law and order? Uh, MacDonald, his initial thoughts are very much along the lines of, if necessary, a punitive expedition. However, Ottawa also recognized that it, Canada lacked the expertise to carry out such, a, such an operation, and so they would need to seek British participation. In fact, the Canadian Privy Council Memorandum from February of 1870 spoke of a military force being at Fort William on Thunder Bay by May 1st with British troops and led by, quote, a British officer of reputation, end quote. Canada's non-permanent active militia relied heavily on the British garrison for training and various other support functions. But at the beginning of 1870, the British government of William Gladstone dropped a bit of a bombshell. Other than Halifax, Britain, with near immediate effect, was going to be withdrawing its garrisons from Canada. This was probably not the best time for Johnny Macdonald to go asking for military support for an operation. Very reluctantly, however, Prime Minister Gladstone and Colonial Secretary Lord Granville did agree on March 5th, 1870, to the participation of British troops. I've thrown in um, Edward Card, a picture of Edward Cardwell as well, simply because he was the Secretary of State for War at the time and was overseeing all these reforms that were triggering the removal of the garrisons. Um, so they agreed to participation, but with some fairly strict conditions. Before the British contingent would journey west, quote, adequate terms, end quote, were to be agreed with the residents of the Red River Settlement. Secondly, the transfer of land from the Hudson's Bay Company to Canada had to be completed, and British troops must be accompanied by a larger Canadian force. I'll just throw in very quickly as well that because Scott was executed on March 4th, this decision is made on March 5th, they're not connected. Uh, MacDonald had asked for mili British military participation much earlier and given the communications of the day, news of, uh, of Scott's execution wouldn't have reached Ottawa yet, let alone London. The other thing that was formed part of this agreement was that British, particip British participation in it would not change the schedule for the withdrawal of the British garrison. This meant that the British troops would have to get to Red River and back in a single season. Now, the anybody who's lived in central Canada, the climate of the North American interior is going to limit the time frame within which the operation can be conducted. So a round trip in a single season is always going to be a very challenging event. But throughout the Red River story, the British are always factoring in the time as a major issue in, in their responses it's very, very important to them that they get in and out in a year. And despite the angry voices from those people in Ontario, 
from Gladstone's and Granville's perspective, this was not a punitive expedition. This was going to be a garrison moving west and taking control of the new Canadian territory. And in fact, on March 23rd, a colonial office communication spoke to this very point. It talked of the maintenance of order at the settlement during the, quote, Canadian annexation, end quote, as the reason for the sending of the military force. Now this is a, Red River is a multi-dimensional story. As I say, this is one of the reasons that I was drawn into it almost immediately. It's, uh, there's just so many levels to it, and there's an American dimension. Um, the United States, and we have to consider what, not only what they were thinking, but also what, that, what their perceived thinking, what sort of an impact that was having on the Canadian government, and the British for that matter. Uh, the fear of the US moving into the Northwest ahead of Canada was a strong influence in Ottawa's decision making at the time. In fact, we now know Washington had no intention of intervening militarily. They still, as I'll talk about in a second, they, would, uh, they still aspired to take control of this territory, but they were no, there were no plans from the government of Ulysses Grant or his Secretary of State uh, to intervene militarily. Uh, however, they also weren't going to do anything that would assist an Anglo-Canadian expedition from moving west as well. Washington's view was more of an anticipation that the lands of the West, and even Canada itself, would ultimately fall into their laps through means other than military conquest. And there was some logic to, the point of, to that point of view, particularly as I'm going to talk about in, in relation to the West. This was, this was we, you know, we all know of the imperial period. Well, this was the period of the 1860s is a very unimperial part of the age of imperialism. And London, at this point, took little interest in Canada and no interest in the lands of the Hudson's Bay Company, or almost no interest in the lands of the Hudson's Bay Company. The Americans at the Red River Settlement reported it would be impossible for the Canadians and the British to send a military expedition through Canadian, terri through Canadian territory simply because there wasn't a viable route. The best routes were south of the Great Lakes through the United States. When the Hudson's Bay and Northwest companies merged, no thought was really given to the best routes. The Hudson's Bay Company was happy to deal with its territory th through its routes from Hudson's Bay. Uh, but over the intervening years, treaties between Britain and the United States put the routes south of the Great Lakes into American territory. So not only did they have the best routes, but by 1870, there was a railway from the eastern U.S. to St. Paul, Minnesota, and a riverboat service on the Red River from Minnesota up to, the, up to Fort Garrett. The preferred mail service to the Red River ran through St. Paul. Washington expected the Canadian government, recognizing that there's no good way to get there, they expected the Canadian government to ask for permission to use American territory to move its, its, its force to the west. It had been determined by, by Grant's government that the answer would be a firm no. Uh, it seemed to the Americans that really all they had to do was wait. And while we're on the US dimension, uh, the US dimension let's also quickly deal with the attitude of Louis Riel to intervention. This is uh, one of his uh, right-hand people at the uh, settlement. He was an American citizen and he was in favor, not only was he, was he a Fenian supporter, but he was in favor of American, the Americans taking over the territories of the Northwest. There were Americans close to Rial during the settlement, during the Troubles, that they would influence him to call on American support was of great concern to Ottawa throughout. It is, however, unlikely that Rial ever intended on calling U.S. support, though he may very well have used it as a bargaining lever early on in, the, in his disputes with Ottawa. But just staying with the U.S. dimension for just a, a moment more, there was a military threat that did indeed need to be taken seriously the Fenian raids by Irish veterans of the American Civil War. These raids had been underway from U.S. territory since 1864, 
Canadian militia forces had not performed particularly well at the Battle of Ridgeway in 1866 on the Niagara frontier, although uh, reforms were implemented afterwards. In fact, the Fenians had no plans at the time to try and stop the Red River Expedition, but this wasn't known. And, in, and two battles were fought uh, on, in Quebec right at the time that the Red River Expedition was landing at Thunder Bay. Uh, Eccles Hill on May 25th and Trout River on May 27th. And, although it postdates the story, in 1871 there would be a raid, a Fenian raid, towards the Red River settlement. So precautions would have to be taken, especially whenever the expedition came close to U.S. territory, as it would on a number of occasions during its trek. It was just one more issue the planners would have to contend with. We'll address other, the other perceived or potential threats to the, the expedition's progress a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, the indigenous tribes, for one, and the Métis. Are they going to intervene? We'll talk about that a little bit later. So I want to switch now and talk about the uh, military command. This is uh, General James Lindsay, Lieutenant General James Lindsay. With the pending withdrawal of the British garrison, the senior British Army position in North America had gravitated from Montreal to Halifax. However, in light of Gladstone's decision to support the expedition to the west, the war office in London became uneasy regarding the, uh, that the troops would be gotten out in time, and they wanted a senior officer closer to the center of events, and so Lindsay was sent out from Britain. He arrived in Montreal on April 4th. He was efficient, he was hard driving, and he was not afraid to rustle feathers when, it, when he felt it necessary. In a, in a largely forgotten military campaign, where possibly a few people will know who act, the man who actually led the expedition, and we'll meet him shortly, Lindsay is the man who had overall responsibility, but nobody knows about him. Nobody knows about him, really anything about him. But let's talk about the man who would actually lead the campaign, Colonel Garnet Wolseley. He came from an impoverished Anglo-Irish military family. In an era when advancement in the army was based on purchase, he advanced solely on merit. He served in the Second Anglo-Burmese War, the Crimean War, the Indian Mutiny, and the Second Opium War. And in the course of these, he was left with a permanent injury to his left leg, he was wounded twice in the right leg, once seriously, and he lost the sight of his left eye. In 1870, he'd been in Canada for eight years, having been among the troops rushed to, Britain, uh, rushed to Canada from Britain after the Trent incident during the American Civil War. He was exceedingly competent, detail-oriented, ambitious, egotistical too. He believed in practical training and army reform, and he was popular with the troops. By 1870, he was deputy quartermaster general, and he was the youngest officer in Canada, excuse me, to have been appointed to this senior staff position. In anticipation of the arrival of Lindsay, he had authored a document, the memorandum regarding the dispatch of an armed force to the Red River Territory. This document included information on troop numbers, methods of movement, and logistic requirements. It was a major reason as to why Lindsay was brought so quickly up to speed when he arrived in Montreal. It's little wonder, therefore, that Wolseley was chosen as the expedition's commanding officer. He was by far the most competent man Lindsay had at his disposal. As a little sidebar, Wolseley had hoped to be appointed Lieutenant Governor of Canada's new empire as well as military commander of the expedition. This was not to be, and we'll hear at the end of the story a little consequence that resulted from this. Appreciate it's difficult to see that, but this is, uh, this is the route from Thunder Bay to the, that the expedition took to Fort Garry. And I want to talk a little bit about the, the routes and the planning. The planners looked at three options. They, one of those options was never to ask the Americans for the use of their territory. It had never factored into the thinking, except for one place, which we'll hear about in a second. 
The favorite option involved going by steamer to Thunder Bay. However, the ice did not break up on, the, on Lake Superior until early May, and this was a crucial factor when, as to when the expedition could begin. However, Lake Superior was the best option as regards being ice-free, even though it wasn't ideal. Uh, Hudson's Bay and then up uh, the Hayes River was one of the rejected options, but the ice-free season on Hudson's Bay was even more limiting. Having said this, there had been actually two previous military uh, expeditions to the Red River Territory by British forces in 1846 and 1857, and both of them had gone via Hudson's Bay and the Hayes River. Given their concerns regarding getting in and out in a single lease season, the British were anxious to arrive at Thunder Bay as soon as the ice had broken so that they could be on their way as quickly as possible. From Thunder Bay, this map here, as I've mentioned, there's no good routes into the interior. It was decided with some variations to use the old Northwest Company route with the Kaministic Korea River as its starting point. I'm going to refer to it as the Cam River from now on. That'll probably save half an hour in the, in the presentation. It had once been part of the Northwest Company's Canoe Highway. It had largely fallen into disuse after the merging of the Northwest Company and the Hudson's Bay Company in 1821. One attraction of the Cam River was that a road was under construction from Thunder Bay to Shebendowan Lake. This would remove the challenge of moving up the difficult Cam River Rapids, which also included the largest uh, waterfall in the, in the uh, Lake Superior watershed. We'll hear more about this road as well in a few minutes. So all told, the route would go a distance of 1,228 miles, broken down as follows. 94 by rail from Toronto to Collingwood, 534 by steamer from Collingwood to Thunder Bay, 50 from Thunder Bay to Shebendowan Lake along the newly constructed road, and then 550 by boat, by boat from Shebendowan Lake to Upper Fort Garry. During this latter stage, this 550 mile jaunt, it was going to be a journey across the lakes, rivers, portages, and watersheds of the Canadian Shield. The, ex the expedition would be uh, operating mostly independently, and the water, would be f the water would be flowing against the expedition until they crossed into the Hudson's Bay watershed about 1,000 feet above Thunder Bay. Then it would be with them until they entered the Red River on the last leg of their journey. However, even when in their favor, the topography and the conditions were challenging and dangerous. So, by boat, you say, Yes, by boat. 102 large rowboats had been ordered uh, before Lindsay arrived, but he didn't think this was going to be enough. So, we, so within a week of his arrival, 33 more were under construction. The expedition would also have two canoes and a gig. The, this route, I mean, under when it was used by the Northwest Company, it was smaller groups of people, and uh, they used canoes. It had never been used by such a large force or by, for most of the trip, boats of this size before. So who's going to go? We know that, Lin that Lindsay's in charge and we know that uh, Wolsey's going to lead it. The British designated the 1st Battalion of the King's Royal Rifle Corps, the 60th Rifles, as their infantry component. The battalion had been in Canada since early in 1867. Frequently, well not frequently, if you, if you uh, hear about the Red River, you'll sometimes hear red coats on the Red River. They're, they're a rifle battalion. If you're going to be completely literal, they're not wearing red coats. Rifle, British rifle regiments, as I'm sure everybody in the room knows, are, wear green uniforms, and the Canadians would be kitted out in the same manner. Uh, the British and Canadian troops were armed with the Snyder Enfield, which we're fortunate enough to have a copy of here today, which I was really intrigued by. Uh, and they would receive the same rates of pay while they were on the expedition, which, made, which meant an increase in pay for the British. Raising the Canadian contingent was more complicated, and when Lindsay arrived, he was annoyed to discover that nothing had been done. 
Remember, the British have this self-imposed but very real schedule, uh, and it's already approaching the middle of April when Lindsay arrives. And they want to they want to be uh, they want to be at Thunder Bay by the beginning of May. And then, secondly, the, it was the Canadian government that had pushed for the expedition, and they'd known the British conditions since March. So the fact that nothing had been done was annoying to Lindsay. He suggested using the Royal Canadian Rifles, which was, a re was actually a regiment of the British Army permanently stationed in Canada. With the withdrawal of the British garrison, the Royal Canadian Rifles were going to be disbanded. They were trained and they were ready to go. But Lindsay's offer was rejected by the Canadian the Department of Militia. The militia department had determined that they were going to raise two battalions of volunteers from the existing Canadian militia regiments, one battalion from Ontario and one battalion from Quebec. The battalion the same size? No, it's smaller. We'll, I'll get to the numbers in a second. There was no shortage of volunteers in Ontario where feelings ran high regarding Thomas Scott, the the ranks filled up very quickly there. Quebec was a different story, and here there were two problems. First, the French-speaking militia members didn't want to go. And secondly, the English-speaking militia members were unwilling to serve under French officers. Lindsay lost patience, and he stepped in, and he recruited 120 men from the Royal Canadian Rifles. Remember I said he was willing to ruffle feathers if he had to. He, he uh, recruited 120 from the Royal Canadian Rifles and the rest of the men in Ontario. Organizing them would take a little bit more time. But ultimately, the expedition would consist of three battalions of infantry with seven companies each, and these are small companies, 756 Canadians in total and 376 British infantry in total. There was a Royal Artillery contingent of four bra brass seven-pounder guns, there were also detachments from the Royal Engineers, the Army Service Corps, and the Army Hospital Corps. All told, the expedition's troop strength came in at approximately 1,200 officers and men, but in addition, there would be around 400 boatmen uh, recruited by the Canadian Public Works Department. And I think, I, don't, I wasn't able to find definitive proof of this, but I think for those who have an interest in the Zulu War, one of the Victoria Cross winners from the Zulu War uh, was, uh, was on the expedition. James Lowe. Ah, that would be why. Um, so, okay, that's better. I can hear that from here too. So, um, just to double back very quickly, I believe that there was a Zulu, a, a strong possibility of a Zulu Award Victoria Cross winner being on the expedition as well. So approval to proceed was received from London on May 6th. This was when the British government had been satisfied that their terms and conditions had been met. Uh, Wolseley received his orders to move on the 12th from Lindsay. He didn't begin to actually move forward towards Thunder Bay until the 21st of May. And these dates will be a little bit important as we get into some of the controversies of the expedition. There's actually a surprising number of controversies in the expedition, which is one of the things that made it interesting to work on. And Wolseley would later allege that these led to delays, and he laid the blame at, on the Canadians. And the three most significant of these delays are, and we'll go through them one at a time, are the hiring of the lake steamers, the canal at Sault Ste. Marie, and the road from Thunder Bay to Shebendowan Lake. So let's deal with the lake steamers first. A supply of ships was always going to be necessary because you needed to transport the force and supplies and keep it supplied from Collingwood in Ontario to Thunder Bay. When it seemed matters, however, had stalled over the hiring of these ships, Lindsay took a special train from Montreal and he went down to Collingwood and he oversaw the settling of terms with three ships. He was then instructed by Ottawa that they would take care of this and the matter was to be handled by the Canadian Postmaster General. 
After further time elapsed with seemingly nothing having happened, Lindsay authorized the chartering of five ships. Wolseley later wrote of his anger at the perceived Canadian inaction, but had the Canadian government actually done nothing? In fact, they had secretly chartered one steamer, and possibly two, under a very lucrative mail contract. Presumably the secrecy was aimed at the Americans, because they didn't want the Americans to know what they were planning, this expedition to the West. Unfortunately, they kept the British in the dark as well. In any case, one or even two steamers was never going to be sufficient. So Lindsay's action was certainly necessary. The muddle in resu resulting from the British planners having to do extra work in the hiring of these steamers certainly was work I'm sure they could have done without, but did it result in a delay? And the answer, in my view, is a strong no. Wolseley said it delayed his departure by two weeks, but the evidence just didn't support this. While the Steamer Saga is underway, the official journal of the expedition clearly speaks to Colonel, to Colonel Wolseley being involved in planning and staff work, as well as readying the two Canadian battalions. Remember, the approval to move is given on May 6, but near the middle of April, the Canadian battalions haven't even been raised. So there's a lot of work to do before they can go, and that's really the reason. The reason why it took Wolseley until the May, May 21st to move, despite the fact of him receiving his orders on May 12th, is because he wasn't ready. Wolseley, in my view, had a legitimate cause to complain about the delay, but based on the raising of the Canadian battalions, but he never mentions this. It's nowhere to be found, no complaints from Wolseley in any of the expedition's records regarding, regarding the Canadian battalions. So we move to the second delaying factor, uh, the canal at Sault Ste. Marie. So between Lake Superior and Huron, the St. Mary's River drops 23 feet. To facilitate the movement of ships between the, the two lakes, the Americans had constructed a canal with locks. The planners of the expedition had surprisingly taken for granted that the Americans would give them uh, use of the canal. Lindsay and Wolseley were astute men, so how they came to this leap of faith, I don't really know. It's a bit of a mystery. But adding to that mystery is that the American Secretary of State had told the British minister in Washington that the British and Canadians would not, and he told them on more than one occasion, that the British and Canadians would not have access to the canal. It seems this news wasn't conveyed, which is surprising to put it mildly, mildly. But in fact, the first steamer of the season did get through on May 5th. The second on May 8th was turned back. Now Washington was prevailed upon fairly quickly to, re to relent and the canal was opened by May 17th, but with conditions. And the conditions were that no troops or material could pass through the canal on the ships meaning that the, the British and Canadians would have to offload everything. Now, they had always intended that they would offload their troops, but offloading their supplies as well created a problem that they hadn't expected. And for a while, Sault Ste. Marie took on an, a level of importance, as you can see in some of these pictures here, because there's an army camp there now, um, a level of importance that the planners of the expedition never intended. And as a consequence, the first troops to actually leave Collingwood were from the Ontario Rifle Battalion, and they were to form a garrison at Sault Ste. Marie. But did it cause a delay? And again, you know, Wolseley would claim that it did. But as with the steamers, there's no evidence to support it, and for the same reasons. Wolseley was simply busy finalizing things. The canal was open by May 17th. He doesn't move until May 21st. So that's not, it, there's no delay. So let's move to the third, the Shebendow and Lake Road. And this is probably the most contentious aspect of the Red River Expedition's journey. The road was under construction and would have run, a run for a distance of 50 miles. 
as the lake sits, as Lake Shebendown Lake sits 839 feet above Thunder Bay, it would be a considerable saving of time and effort for the expedition as they wouldn't have to pass through the difficult rapids and of the Cam River and that waterfall that I mentioned before, the largest in the watershed. It's con the construction of the road was being handled by this fellow, Simon Dawson of the Canadian Public Works Department. The truth of the matter, however, was that the road simply was not going to be ready when the expeditionary force arrived. It just it wasn't close to being ready. The leading elements began landing at Thunder Bay. The leading elements of the expedition began landing at Thunder Bay on May 25th. Uh, they named it Prince Arthur's Landing, which is just close to Fort William, so we get the original names of the, two, the twin towns of that area, uh, Fort, Arthur and, uh, Fort William and Port Arthur. Uh, the first troops, May 25th they land, the first troops don't set out on Shebendown Lake until July 16th. It says, it, yeah. Simon Dawson was responsible for a great many tasks associated with the expedition, not just the road. He oversaw the building of the boats as well that they used, uh, and a lot of other things too. Um, he was efficient and capable, but likely had far too much on his plate. However, the completion of the road was hampered by torrential rain, and we'll talk about that a little more as well as, the, as this presentation progresses. Torrential rain poured in the days and weeks after the force landed, and also before the force had landed, uh, forest fires had swept through the area. And so bridge work that had been constructed over the previous season and lumber that had been prepared for more bridge work was destroyed and had to be redone. So it wasn't all down to Dawson. It should also be realized as well that in 1870, this, the Rose location was in, a, in an isolated part of the world. Construction of what was going to be, because this road was already under construction, it had nothing to do with the expeditionary force. It was going to be the Canadian settler route to the west. Uh, and it had been progressing at a leisurely pace. And, then, uh, and it shuts down in October, 19, uh, October 1869. It's, the winter sets in. And uh, Dawson leaves, and they leave a skeleton crew there. And then in January, suddenly, this is a crisis. And Dawson starts receiving letters from his boss saying, when will the road be ready? The problem he makes is he overpromises. Wolseley would later claim that he'd been told that the road would be ready. Sorry. He later was told that the road would be ready when he, when he arrived. This is stretching the truth, and he and Lindsay knew it wasn't going to be ready. But just how unready it was was probably something of a shock. But despite all of that, the records of the force indicate that it's fairly late in the day before Wolseley starts to commit anything to paper where he's getting concerned. It's most of his writings uh, in the force journal early on, at, during his time at, at, on the road, is pretty optimistic. Oops. However, with progress stalling and fear growing that he wouldn't get his, his, keep in mind, this is his first independent command. He's a guy going places. Wolsey wants to make sure he makes good. He's starting to get worried that is he going to get his force in and out in a year? If he doesn't, that's going to be a fairly serious black mark against his career. Um, he decides he's going to try moving the boats up the Cam River, despite the waterfall and despite all the rapids. Uh, some had already gone up the road, but it had been a difficult journey, and Wolseley worried that their weight would destroy the road surface. He wanted to keep the, try and maintain the road surface for all the other supplies. Dawson disagreed. The boats were his baby, and uh, he was concerned that they'd be put at risk by hauling him up the river. He eventually grudgingly dispatched some of the uh, boatmen to work them up the river after British troops had taken the first batch up, but he was never in favor of it. My read of it was Rosley was probably right. He had, to get, he had to do something to get things moving, but Dawson, it clearly rankled with Dawson. After the expedition returns, for whatever reason, who knows why, Wolseley writes a three-part article for a journal, Blackwood's Journal in, in Britain. Um, and he 
essentially, it's a pretty inflammatory article, uh, three-part article. He essentially turns what should have been a closed book into an open sore. He's quite complimentary about Dawson, the person, but he's critical of everything, pretty much everything that Dawson was responsible for. Um, Dawson had not yet completed his final report, and he didn't let matters lie. He replied very strongly, but not just about the big issues. He, he, taught, he gets into nitpicky stuff as well. However, insofar as the road being a delaying factor to the force, there's no question it was. But whether or not that could have been fixed by additional, by other activities by Dawson, I don't see how, given the rain and the forest fires. So let's move on to the journey. Oh, there's those red coats on the Red River again. The advance, the advance elements of the expedition finally set off on the evening of July 16th. They traveled in self-contained boat brigades. This is a, the term is a holdover from the days of the fur trade. It has, it's not to be connected with the military term brigade. Uh, they traveled in uh, typically six boats in each brigade. Uh, they didn't move as a compact mass, and they would be spread out over as much as 150 miles. There was one guide for each brigade, and each boat had two boatmen. Wolseley was critical of many of these, many of the boatmen, and he ordered any who did not know his business was to be put off and sent back. Some were weeded out even before departure, but even so, one in seven was, was sent back once the expedition had reached uh, Fort Francis. He had, Wolseley had nothing but praise, however, for the Iroquois boatmen who had been recruited from villages near Montreal. And if somebody in the audience mentioned uh, their descendants would participate in a future Wolseley expedition in the Sudan. Three boat braids broke three... This is an excuse... Three boat brigades together with two of the expedition's guns set out on the 16th. The other two guns were left behind at uh, a fort that was constructed at Prince Arthur's Landing. The purpose of the fort was to protect the line of communication in, in the event of a Fenian incursion and also to provide a secure base if Wolseley ran into opposition and was forced to fall back. A company of the Quebec rifles would remain there as garrison. The other brigades would depart at intervals in the next two plus weeks. The King's Royal Rifle Corps, the Royal Artillery, and the Royal Engineers led the way. The first brigade of the Ontario Rifles left on July 21st, the first of the Quebec Rifles on August 1st. The reason is, uh, for the staggered uh, approach to this, is the uh, various portages can only take so many men and equipment at any given time. But Wolseley made sure he had sufficient strength in the vanguard in case he ran into trouble. If anybody wanted to lay an ambush, it was perfect country. However, a political officer, a guy by the name of Weems Simpson, had gone on ahead to speak with the indigenous people in the expedition's path, and Wolseley met him uh, as Simpson was returning, and Simpson's news was there would be no opposition from the indigenous people. He still had concerns about the Fenians and the Métis, and he was right to take every precaution. As, already, as I've already touched upon, uh, there was no risk from the Fenians, but we'll talk a little bit about the potential of Métis opposition shortly. Just a bit of information about the, the, the expedition and, and how they operated. There would be no spirits consumed during the journey. The men would drink tea and their, their health remained remarkably robust. The rations had been strictly calculated, but quickly became monotonous. And one officer described the food as, quote, choke dog. The weight of cargo in each boat ranged from three to 4,000 pounds. The boats were so heavily laden that the rowers struggled to find places for their feet. Along the journey, there were 47 portages varying in length from 100 yards to over a mile. Where the boats could be gotten through without being dragged across, they would be unloaded and run through the rapids. Otherwise, they were hauled over the portages as well, and they were not lightly constructed for obvious reasons. When, the portaging, when portaging, everything had to be carried over, 
Salted pork barrels weighed 200 pounds, flour barrels 120, biscuit barrels 100. One officer recorded that he became proficient at carrying 200 to 250 pound loads, and some of the First Nations guides carried three to 400 pounds. Late in the expedition, one of the boatmen was noted to have carried a weight of 528 pounds. Everyone who left a record mentions insects. Mosquito oil was largely useless, not to mention probably injurious to the health of the person using it because it contained creosote. In his darkened tent, one officer uh, doused himself in what he thought was mosquito oil to find out in the morning that he, the bottle next to him contained sauce. It was eventually noted that the indigenous boatmen rubbed the exposed parts of their body with pork fat, and the troops eventually copied this. During the 94 days between the landing of the first British troops at Thunder Bay and the arrival of the British battalion at Upper Fort Garry, it rained, sometimes torrentially, on 45 of them. The men were constantly wet, either either from the rain or from their uh, not infrequent dips into the water on some task or other, and their clothing quickly began to wear out and rot. Oops. The lead brigade reached Fort Francis, about 225 miles from Shebendown Lake, on August 4th. The troops continued on immediately, but Wolseley remained for a few days. Fort Francis was going to become an advanced base, and he wanted to ensure this was up to his satisfaction. It would contain a 36-bed hospital, a field oven, and a bakery. A worn company of the Ontario Rifles would remain as garrison. Shortly before arriving at Fort Francis, Wolseley was met by this fellow, William Butler. His special intelligence officer had traveled through the United States to gauge American reaction to the expedition. He had passed through the Red River settlement as he, as he made his way to link up with the expedition, and he even had a meeting with Louis Real at the upper fort. Precisely what intelligence Butler provided is unclear. There's nothing in the official record of the expedition that speaks to it. Uh, but nevertheless, the story is one of the most interesting and entertaining of the whole expedition. And I'll just add, because I noted, I only noted this when I came in to, today, but he would later marry a woman named Elizabeth, who became Elizabeth Lady Butler. She painted that picture of the charge of the Scots Grays in the back, in the back corner. <laughs> as well as a number of other military prints. Um, while, Wolseley, while Wolseley completed his tasks at Fort Francis, the brigades ahead of him were able to unfurl their sails on Lake of the Woods, and they flew across to Rat Portage, today the site of Kenora. By the time Wolseley arrived at Lake of the Woods, a storm had blown up, and he was forced to take shelter on an island. As the lake began to calm, he wanted to get moving. Not surprisingly, he was anxious to get going. And uh, his Iroquois boatman suggested it was still too rough, but this was Garnet Wolseley. He wasn't going to, nothing was going to stop him. So he set out in the gig without a guide and promptly got lost. Uh, the alarm bells were ringing when he finally made it into Kenora, uh, being taken in, led by an indigenous family he'd met along the way. The next stage of the journey was down the Winnipeg River to Fort Alexander, and this was probably the most challenging of the entire trip. Over 163 miles, the river dropped 349 feet. One expedition member reported that it was good, that it was fortunate that they were doing this at the end of the trip when they'd become proficient in the handling of the boats rather than at the beginning. The accounts also speak to how often near disaster was averted by the skill of the Iroquois boatmen as well as Ojibwe boatmen who had now joined them. 
The British troops had all reached Fort Alexander near Lake Winnipeg on August 18th. Wolseley arrived two days later. He'd been playing catch up and traveling by canoe and his party had passed through the first two Ontario battalion brigades. It's interesting to contemplate what was going through his mind at this point with his goal almost in sight. He would later write of the urgency of reaching the settlement due to letters received from the English speaking residents urging him to make haste. Wolseley did not have all the pieces of the intelligence puzzle at his disposal as I did as I was going through them. And as a highly competent professional soldier leading his first independent command and anxious to make an impression, he was going to be ready for everything, for anything. This was only natural for a soldier of his stature. However, if we take Wolseley's later writings at face value, and I'm not, I'm not completely sure we should, but if we do, in spite of his clear orders that he was not leading a punitive expedition, the closer he got to Upper Fort Garry, the more he was spoiling for a fight. There is, however, absolutely no evidence that Real ever intended to oppose the arrival of the expedition. In any case, back at Fort Alexander, Wolseley didn't wait. The he didn't wait for the Canadians to catch up. He set off for Upper Fort Garry on the afternoon of August 21st. And moving when he did would prove to be a wise decision because a fierce storm was about to blow in. The storm would delay those two forward Canadian brigades uh, from crossing the lake. And it would have delayed the British too had they waited. There was a fair wind blowing as the flotilla of boats set out containing the British troops on Lake Winnipeg. They spent the night on Elk Island and were consumed by the local insect life. The following morning, they entered the Red River and for the first time since crossing Height of Land Portage were moving against the current. Wolseley hoped to make the lower fort before nightfall, but he was still 12 miles short when he, when he, when he broke for the night. The next morning, August 23rd, they set off early and had and breakfasted at Lower Fort Garry. There, Wolseley learned that, that nobody in the settlement knew of the force's presence on the river, and he wanted to keep it that way. Most of the troops, uh, oh, pardon me, the boats were lightened to four days of provisions. The upper fort was 21 and a half miles away by road. Most of the troops continued the journey in their boats with one company moving as a flank guard on the road. All those who left accounts at this point speak of the triumphal reception they received. They were passing through the settlement's English-speaking parishes. By nightfall, they were still six miles short of their goal and the weather had turned decidedly nasty. The rain fell in torrents. The troops spent the night in the open in the driving rain. Anybody who ventured out from the direction of, of the upper fort was detained to spend the night in the rain as well. Wolseley was determined that he was gonna maintain the secrecy of his presence. By the following morning, the rain had converted the road into a muddy morass, and so it was decided to remain in the boats a while longer. Two miles from the upper fort, the expedition landed at Point Douglas, and in, and in extended battle order, made their final approach. Most accounts speak of an expectation of battle. There was, however, no opposition, and Upper Fort Garry was occupied by the British contingent of the expeditionary force on the morning of August 24th. Riel's breakfast was found on the table, but the Métis leader and his immediate followers, possibly having received word of the mood in the expedition, wisely decided to withdraw. It was thought they could be seen in the distance, but Wolseley made no effort to pursue them and in subsequent days refused to issue warrants from residents who had opposed him to, to go in search of an arrest. It'll be recalled that earlier I said that Wolseley had wanted to be named Lieutenant Governor as well, and, he, and this had been denied. He took the view that he had no civil authority, he was a military commander, he achieved his, his goal, and he, kept, and he occupied the fort. Any further action would have to await the arrival of the Lieutenant Governor. So, 
The first Canadian troops arrived on August 27th, and two days later, after all those exertions, the first British troops began to trek back to Canada. By October, they were all barracked in Quebec, awaiting their departure from Canada. Wolseley left the Red River settlement on September 10th. He'd been there for 18 days. He passed through Toronto without stopping. Lindsay was returning to England and it's, and it's suggested they both travel home on the same ship. Wolseley left Canada at the beginning of October and would not return to the country where he'd spent the better part of a decade. The Canadian contingent remained in the West and became the garrison of Canada's new empire. Further Canadian Red River expeditions, and there were several that would follow, uh, would reinforce Canada's garrison. The period that followed would see the region's opening to European immigration and the end of the way of life to many of the existing inhabitants. It's the classic story of once one culture uh, moving in into another culture's territory. Uh, in his orders to Wolseley, Lindsay had been quite specific that he was to, not to take anybody who had been involved in the troubles at the Red River Settlement over the winter of 1869-1870. But, though many of the, ex the Ontario men had not been involved in the troubles, they were, they certainly had, uh, they, part of the reason they joined up was because they were angry about what had happened with Scott. And there's no question that there, were, there was some retribution after the Canadians arrived. Um, but as for the expedition itself, planned and carried out by Wolseley and Lindsay, and viewed as an example of a British military expedition of the mid-Victorian period, it was a planning and logistical masterpiece. To take a force of over 1,200 men into the wilderness across a largely disused and forgotten route that had not previously seen such a large body of men was a significant accomplishment and Wolseley was well on his way to the top of his profession. He was destined for further high profile appointments and these would follow. A quarter of a century later, he had become commander in chief of the British Army. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll take questions, but please make your questions short and to the point. Thank you. This uh, intrigued by the combination of uh, artwork and photographs. And I know it's a little bit later, but there's a fellow buried in the uh, Veterans Cemetery here in Victoria, uh, Colonel uh, what's it, James Peters. Yeah. And he's reported that uh, Fatash and Fish Creek have taken the first made battlefield photograph. <coughs> Um, there, I mean, no, there's photographs of the individuals, but there were no, I didn't see any photographs, because uh, this is 15 years earlier, yeah. Yes? I was wondering if, if you have detailed lists of the participants. I have some. From the RCR. Now, my grandmother told me that her, her father had been a member of the RCR. In fact, I have this medal at home, the Canada medal. Was given to our yeah. But I've never found his name listed. Well, the list that I found is not complete. I, I have found a publication that has uh, quite a number of the names, although not from the Quebec Battalion. And if he was RCR, he may very well have been in the Quebec Battalion. But I do have uh, some names of the Ontario men. If you give me his name, I can I can look it up and see if it's there. Yes. What can you say about the, those uh, boats that they were constructing? How long? I can. I can give you that information if you want. I just have to scroll back a little bit. They were they varied in size. Just let me. I appreciate that we're running out of time here. I actually uh, edited that piece out, but I've got still got the information in it. I'm just amazed as a retired logistics officer myself. I'm just stunned at what they did. I know. And what they had to do it with. It's it's. They must have been some of the most fit men on the continent by the time they got to Winnipeg. Well, they certainly were later. Um, 
Can, maybe, maybe I can get it to you. I'll, I'll find it once we're done here. So that I, there's any more questions. Yes, sir. Did, did, did this activity have any influence on the formation of the RCMP or the North West Mounted Police in 1874 and then the uh, expedition of 1875 led by the son of Charles Dickens who then went on to the western part of the country all the way to where eventually Fort McClellan? Well, I, I don't think there's a there's a a direct connection where you can say yes, this led to this, but I think there's a there's there is a connection of some kind because I think fairly quickly the Canadian government re recognized they needed mounted infantry. Uh, the the Red River Expedition was an infantry force. Uh, there's a, an amusing part in the book where they did commandeer some horses as they were making their their way along the Red River in the final approaches to the fort. But now they're an infantry force. And I think, given the vast plains, probably the experience of the expedition, and also the fact that during that 1871 Red River uh, uh, Fenian attack, uh, the Métis formed companies that served on Canada's side as mounted infantry. So I think there was probably a recognition that mounted infantry was probably the way to go. The western uh, track of 1875, led by the son of Charles Dickens, who was also recruited from the British Army yeah. and given the rank of inspector in the RCMP. Dickens of the Mounted. Yeah. Yes. Well, could I just elaborate on the point that you made, Paul, about uh, the Sudan? So uh, you noted the, uh, the, the uh, exploits of the Iroquois boatmen. So when Wolsey was uh, put in charge, and correct me if I'm wrong, to uh, relieve Gordon at the Sudan, he had to take the British expedition up the, up the Nile River and remember this uh, experience and therefore recruited, I'm not sure how many hundred Canadian boatmen to go to Egypt to take a British expedition up the Nile. Roy, Ma Roy McLaren, former Minister of International Trade, has written a very interesting mm -hmm. book back in the 80s, I think, called yeah, Canadians on the Nile, 1885. Yeah. It all yeah. goes back to... It all goes back. Wolseley tried to replicate his experience. Didn't quite work out quite so well. And he also formed a desert column uh, during the Sudan campaign as well. But didn't, they, they got there a little late. But still, yeah, I mean, it's interesting that he thought so highly of what he'd accomplished in 1870. Yes, sir. To induce the native uh, participation, were they paid or in what way? Were they induced to come on board? They were paid. They were paid by the Canadian government. Sorry? Individually, yeah. Yeah, well, usually in groups. There was like when it comes to the Iroquois, there was a um, uh, they had a leader that uh, that Wolseley spoke very highly of, and he was he probably oversaw their their raising of them and bringing them out. But no, they were definitely paid because um, one thing I didn't get into. I mean, I got into enough. Here with it. You can see it's very involved. Uh, one of the things I left out in the talk was that when they first set out on Shebendown Lake, they discovered that there was a shortage of, uh, of boatmen. And the reason was is because they hadn't been contracted to work on Sundays. And so Wolseley was going like, what are you, going to Dawson and saying, what are you talking about? You know? And he said, well, you, they're, they're around somewhere. You get them if you want them. And Wolseley said, no, they do a deal with them, pay them to work on Sundays, I need them seven days a week. And that's ultimately what happened. So they were paid. Yes, sir. You probably already mentioned the size of the companies was standard 50 plus yeah. by yeah. captain. Yes. Not a major. Yeah. Uh, yeah, mainly. I mean, it's interesting because certainly from the Canadian perspective, everybody in Ontario, at least, everybody in the militia wanted to go. And while they were held up, on the road at, at Thunder Bay, people were coming. People were taking the steamer and either trying to get taken on the expedition or just coming for a visit. So, like Otter goes, uh, and he hangs around until for a couple of weeks and then heads back to Canada. So, um, with the Canadians, there were a number of officers who would have taken a demotion so that they could go. Like Sam Steele is an example. He was. He was, uh, I mean, he'd been an officer in the militia, but he went as an enlisted man. And there's, there's other examples of that as well. Yes, sir. So, so that picture you showed there, uh, one individual who was Colonel Steele, if not Sam Steele. Uh, Colonel. Sam Steele was, was the Mountie. Yeah, no, no. Kurt, Russian. No, I don't have a picture of Sam Steele. No, there was a, 
I'll uh, double check it later. I, I don't remember the steel, but. Oh, yeah. 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 Yes, sir. You said they were paid in what? Good question. I don't, that, it didn't talk. I mean, it might have mentioned that. I don't recall the details of that. They were probably paid, they might have been paid in gold, they might have been paid in coin. I don't think they were paid in kind. Although, that probably would have included in that their provisions would have been taken care of while they were on the trip. But I, I would think they were, played, they were paid in currency. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much.